middle of the story of Cain and the famous verse we discussed last week, God says to Cain, hey, Hevel Achicha, where is Hevel, your brother? And Cain responds and he says, I have no idea. <clears throat> Hashomer Achi Anochi, am I my brother's keeper? And last week we offered all the various interpretations of what exactly he meant. And in short, he defends himself and he says, basically, um, it's not really my fault. And just to mention a few of them, just quickly, he says, well, I may have never known that you never told me that murder is a prohibition. He says, well, I'm not the keeper. You're the keeper. You're, you're, you're God. You're powerful. You're the king. We had a metaphor of the two fighters in front of the king. And when one fighter kills the other, the blood of the, the one who was killed calls out against the king. So in some sense, God is responsible for allowing this, et cetera. We have many various interpretations. Um, God says, God responds and he says, verse 10, and that and we also just began to discuss that last verse. Um, then he said, meaning God says, what have you done? The voice of your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. And what exactly does that mean? So it means the crime scene it calls out. In other words, again, depending on how you read, re mean what Cain, how you understand Cain's words. I think the most beautiful one is according to the opinion that says, I think it's the Kliakar who says, we have never been told. I have never been told that murder is prohibited. So God says, the fact that murder is wrong calls out from the ground. In other words, you don't need divine revelation. But in any case, the earth itself calls out, calls out against the crime. And therefore, <clears throat> There has to be a, a response, and there has to be a punishment, there has to be justice, and that we'll read about in the next verse. But in any case, one interesting Rashi is, <clears throat> I think we alluded, to it, we alluded to it in the past also, is that you don't get it in the English because the English, they translate it so it can be smooth. So they write, um, <clears throat> the voice of your brother's blood, but in Hebrew, the word blood is written deme, bloods, plural. So one way, to, one way to read it is that your brother, it's not just killing brother, but when you kill somebody, you're not just killing him, but it's also the future generations. And therefore it is a, therefore it's a, it's the, the crime is multiplied many, many, many times over. And that's the deme, the bloods, the plural that, that, is, that describe the, the severity of the sin. So that's in any case, that's basically what we have been discussed, discussing until now. Now we have to see what is the consequence of this, of this great crime. And we're going to have two verses of the consequence, then Cain's response, and then God's response to Cain. So in other words, there's some negotiation taking place. The first thing we'll do is we'll read the verses and we'll see what, what, what we can come up with. So let's read verse 11. So God says, what have you done, right? The voice of your brother's blood calls out from the earth, to me from the earth. And verse 11 says, therefore, you are cursed more than the ground. Now, I'm not sure what more, if, if okay, we can, I'll just read it and then we'll, we'll analyze. In any case, let me just read this translation, even though I'm not sure this is the exact translation, but okay. So I'm going back to verse 11. Therefore, you are cursed more than the ground, which opened wide its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. So you're going to be cursed more than the ground. When you work the ground, it shall no longer yield its strength to you. You shall become a, a vagrant and a wanderer on earth. Okay, so basically there's two, there's two punishments. Number one, I guess one is a result of the other. Number one, is that the earth, because the earth is almost complicit, one way to think about it is like the earth is responsible. You, you, you sort of, you got the earth involved in this crime by forcing it to cover over the blood of your brother, which is something the earth doesn't wanna do because the earth does not want to get involved in this injustice, but the earth has no choice. So in some sense, you, you have involved the earth and that's also a crime. Therefore, the result will be the earth will no longer give its strength to you. And like Rashi explains that <clears throat> the earth was cursed already after the sin of Adam. And the verse, and God tell, tells Adam that the earth will give forth 
um, quotes the dar dar, the earth will give, give forth uh, thorns and weeds when you plant. So now, so that was, that was the difficulty of Adam, but now the curse is even gonna be multiplied toward, to, to Cain. When Cain plants, it's not gonna work. Cain's gonna plant and the earth is gonna not give forth, not gonna yield its, 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 its strength. So therefore he will not be able to get involved in agriculture. And therefore as a result, you'll be a wanderer on earth. You're not gonna live in one place. You're not gonna be able to settle the way um, he has done, because if you think about it, what was Cain's preferred occupation? Cain was Oved Adama. Cain shows agriculture, as opposed to Hevel, who chooses to graze sheep, to raise sheep. If you're going to raise sheep, you're on the move. You're on the move for graze, for, 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 for a food for the cattle. So Hevel is perfectly happy to be on the go. Cain wants to settle. Cain wants roots in the ground. That's the idea of agriculture. He doesn't want to be a wanderer. He doesn't want to be a hunter-gatherer. He wants to stop in one place. He wants to settle in one place. But now the curse is that it's not going to work for you because your agriculture is going to fail. That is, um, that's, that's the verses. Now, Cain cannot, it's a very strange verse. They can read this verse anyway. Let's read Cain's response. Okay, it's already in English. It gives it away. In other words, it's taking a side. Cain said to Hashem, is my iniquity too great to be, to be born? Gadol avonim in so, is my iniquity too great for God to carry? Now they ask it as a question. Other people say it's not a question, it's a statement. He says, Gadol avonim in so, my sin is too great to be born. It's too great to carry. In other words, is he confessing? It's a little bit late. God gave him the chance to confess before the punishment. God says, where is your brother? He should have confessed. He didn't. The qu God gives him the punishment. Then he says, then the question is, is he confessing? Or is he just negotiating a plea? Is he negotiating for the punishment? So that's the question. So that's why you have, um, they, they translate that Rashi, but to me, that's a wonder. It's a question. He tells Cain, that's it? I mean, you can't handle a sin, so I killed somebody. Is my sin too great to handle? In other words, are you going to give such a severe punishment for um, murder? Now for us, it's not such a big punishment. Okay, you're not going to prison. You're not going to be killed. You're just going to wander a little bit. But you have to understand from Cain's perspective, what is Cain? Cain hopes to have lay roots in the ground. That's exactly what he wants. That's his aspiration. If you tell him he cannot settle in one place in the agriculture, that's everything he's hoped for has been shattered. So he says, is, 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 this, is, is, this, is my sin, is my sin, is my iniquity too great to be born? Behold, you have banished me this day from the face of the earth. Can I be hidden from your presence? I must become a vagrant and a wanderer on earth. Whoever meets me will kill me. I don't know exactly what he's saying. He's basically saying, look, if, I'm the, if, I'm, if I am on the move, I have no permission to stand in one place, then ultimately um, some people are going to kill me. I don't have any roots. I can't protect myself. And therefore, ultimately, what you're really giving me is a death sentence, maybe a delayed one. So Hashem, verse 15, Hashem said to him, therefore, whoever slaves Cain before seven generations have passed will be punished. In other words, God is saying, um, God is going to protect that Cain should not be killed before seven generations. In other words, the, the, the punishment is delayed. And Hashem placed a mark upon Cain. Okay, one way to translate it. So that none that meet him might kill him. So in other words, somehow or another, Cain becomes, um, um, Cain is, is, uh, is reassured that God is going to protect him. How? God puts the, a sign on Cain. What exactly does that mean? There's many different opinions. We'll get to that. The verse continues. I'm just going to try to get the full story before we can start breaking things down. Verse 16, Cain left the presence of Hashem and settled in the land of Nod, east of Eden. Whoa, he settled. Is that what he's supposed to do? I don't know. God just told him to be a wanderer, so we have to deal with that. Next, one more verse, um, 17. And Cain knew his wife, and she conceived and bore Chanoch, Enoch, Chanoch in Hebrew. He became a city builder, and he named the city after his son, Enoch, after his son, Chanoch. So here we read, Cain is, is, I guess, the conventional interpretation, Cain builds a city. 
and he names the city for his son, Hanoch. Now, again, is this consistent with what God tells him? Cain building a city. Is that good? Is that bad? That's something to think about because the city is not necessarily wandering. So that is some of the questions we have to deal with. We want to figure out what is, what is the punishment? Why does God give him this punishment? How does he negotiate? When he negotiates with God, does he get a better deal? Does he get a worse deal? And then we want to know the result. How does he live after the punishment? And is he, in fact, listening to God and submitting to God's will? Or is, he, or is it just a continuation of ignoring God? So these are some of the issues we have to address when we talk about the story of Cain and the punishment of Cain. And uh, I guess the journey begins. But in the meantime, if anyone has any comments or questions, just on the simple meaning or any suggestions, please share. Otherwise, we continue. Just one more obstetrical question that you might answer for me. Yeah. Um, these early families, are they all incestuous? I mean, where do we get all these kids? Well, if you want to read about, if you want to read about, if you want to read the, 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 the traditional conventional interpretation is yes, Cain has to, Cain has to marry his um, sister. And I think we alluded to in the past, the verse says that when the verse says that, that she gave birth, that, that Eve gave birth to Cain and Hevel, both Cain and Hevel, it says the word et, which can be an additional word. It's a connecting word in Hebrew, but it can be an additional word. And therefore, uh, Rashi says that that et means an additional child. And with every child she gives, um, with, with both Cain and Hevel, she also has a, twi a, 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 a female. So there's a twin sister. And with Hevel, there's a actually triplets. Hevel, it says the word et, um, Et achiv et hevel. It says the word et twice. Rashi says that there's actually triplets and two girls. And there's a medrash that says that's in fact why Cain kills Hevel. They're really fighting about who's going to get the third girl. And um, that's what the medrash says. So the bottom line is, yeah, if you want to read this story simply, in other words, the pshat, the simple level, you're going to say that they marry their sisters. Um, I could be disbarred for this, but uh, other ways of reading the story is not necessarily, okay, I shouldn't really say this, especially not on the recording but I can get this barred for this to get into trouble. But in any case, other ways of reading the story is not necessarily that Cain and Hevel, that Adam and Eve are the first human beings, right? Because they just lived 6,000 years ago, we have records of human beings living before. So a more modern way of reading it, again, not endorsing, just putting it out there, is that, of course, there were, um, there were uh, homo sapiens before Adam and Eve. When we say Adam and Eve are the first people what we are saying is that they're the first people whose story is relevant to us. They're the first people that have the sense of free choice, that develop, their morality develops to the point where they can understand the commandment of God. And if you want to read the story that way, then you don't really have to say that they didn't have anybody else to marry, right? They were the first people, but there are many other homo sapiens running around the planet. So you have a choice. I'm not going to sort of uh, superimpose my views here. I'll be honest, I'm going to take the traditional view, but uh, you could still, you're not going to get booted off the call if you take uh, the more modern views. So that's the way we at least tolerate, Rabbi. Rabbi? Yeah, at least tolerate other opinions. Okay, yeah. Rabbi, what was the sign? I mean, sometimes uh, the Bible refers to, and this will be the sign, and they don't tell you what the sign is. Yeah, so we'll get uh, this to is one of those occasions. What, okay. was, what was the sign? And this significant because of uh, later anti-Semites um, would uh, lay a claim to that, to this is how they can identify Jews so they can persecute them. Yeah, so let's think about what the sign is and if the sign is positive or negative. So we'll get to that, we'll get to that, absolutely. Uh, question, Rabbi. Yes, Steve. So the Adam was given six of the seven Noahide laws, correct? It depends who you ask. If you ask the rabbis, they say yes. And therefore our whole discussion that we had last week about, about um, Kayan saying, that you never told me I cannot kill, the rabbis say, no, you were told because God told, um, God gave Adam six of the seven command, six of the seven Noahide laws. But the problem is that that's not in shot. That's not written in the simple story. Therefore, other commentators say, look, it could be that happened, but when you read the simple story, there's no indication. So we need an interpretation that will follow, be consistent with the simple interpretation. So I agree mm -hmm. with you, Steve. My, my, I would say the rabbinic tradition is Adam has been told and Adam passes on to Cain and Cain therefore does not have a defense by saying, I've never been told. That is the, that's, the, that's, the, that's the rabbinic tradition. 
And therefore, from the perspective of the sages of the Talmud, this is not a question. But I'm telling you that the other- So, so if, if, if Adam was told that by Hashem and, and he did disseminate that, is Adam considered a prophet? Um, yes, if God, yeah. Now, clearly Adam, clearly God speaks to Adam. Even if you read the simple interpretation, even if you don't say that, that even if you don't say that God told him six of the seven Ohai laws, but God speaks to Adam. God says, don't eat the tree of knowledge, right? There is, there is punishment. There, there is a communication of a commandment. So clearly Adam is considered a prophet. Do we count him amongst one of the prophets of the Jewish people? I don't think so. I don't think we think he's specifically Jewish. He's probably universal. So do we classify him as a conventional prophet? I don't remember. Um, but, but the Talmud list of 24 prophets, a general, pro I don't remember how many, I think it's 24 um, prophets that, that, that rose to the Jewish people. But Adam is not necessarily for the Jewish people. Our, Adam is mm. the is sort of collective humanity. I think if, if I remember right, it's, it's 57 prophets and seven prophetesses. Correct, correct. I, my numbers are Sunday morning. I'm not good with numbers. <laughs> <laughs> No, it's in this week. This week we have the the haftorah is is, is uh, the 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 story of Devorah, the prophetess, and her beautiful song. So if even if you don't come every Wednesday, this Wednesday you don't want to miss. This is a plug for Wednesday's haftorah. <laughs> just, just, just one other question: Which is the one law he didn't give Adam? So to, the seventh law is not to eat um, um, the flesh of a living animal. And, and in other words, in those days, there, wouldn't, there was no refrigeration, so you can't eat a full cow. So it was common to tear a limb off from the animal, eat the one limb today for supper, and you eat the next limb tomorrow night for supper. But why kill the animal? If you kill the animal, you have to, the, the, you, the, the animal, the, the, the meat will rot. So the law is that you're not allowed to tear a limb from a living animal, which is basically uh, the general law is not to cause suffering to animals. The reason why Adam does not have that commandment is of course because Adam was not allowed to eat any animals to begin with. So it wasn't relevant to Adam. Only when Noah got after the flood, for whatever reason, we'll get to that in a few months or a few years, um, certainly after the vaccine is available, so we can debate that in person. Um, so when we get to that, we'll discuss why Noah is allowed, is, God says you're allowed to eat meat. However, if you eat meat, you have to do so with the compassion. And therefore, you can't cause unjust suffering, unjust, um, uh, un unnecessary pain to the animal. So that's the seventh. Thank you, Rabbi. Rabbi, you were talking about, um, you know, we know that Cain's line ended, and you alluded to the fact that it did not. Oh, that's, that's the, some of the rabbinic tricks. We'll get to that either today or, or Okay. Next. All right. Then forget that question. Just, yeah. just a quick so, but, but I just want to go to Jill for a second. You have to understand, the easy way to read the story is Cain is bad, Hevel is good, okay? The rabbis don't want to do so because there's too much good in Cain, too much potential in Cain. So if you want to read it simply, you say, okay, if you read the story simply, we'll get to that, the ge uh, ge genealogy of Cain ends, the flood, everyone is destroyed. The rabbis say too much good in Cain to, to allow this to be wasted, to say that it's all destructive. So the rabbis are going to perform a very simple trick. It's not that... It's very, it's very, actually very elegant. Oh, one of the wives, one of the wives of, yeah, of the son. Yeah, oh, yeah. Okay. one of the wives, okay. you Noah's know, wife, very simple, not alluded to in the verse, but nothing the rabbis cannot do, okay? What are they really <laughs> doing? No, but okay. no, no, I'm serious. The, the, the Torah name, by the way, the Torah doesn't name no, any- one of Noah's daughter-in-laws is a descendant okay. of Let's Cain. think about this for a second. I, I, it's, it's, not a, it's not a joke. The Torah does not list the names of the women, okay? One woman is listed. Achot Tuvalkain. Tuvalkain's sister is Nama. We'll get to it. One woman is listed. Why is she listed? Okay, I understand. Women should be listed. I understand. I'm going to get into trouble um, 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 because the Torah is not feministic enough. But the point is this. The point is women are not listed, period, in this genealogy. One woman is listed. Why? Must be she's significant. What is her significance? Did she create anything? No. Everybody else who was listed is the father of some industry. She is not listed. She's listed. She, she didn't create anything. Why is she listed? She's significant. Why is she significant? Say the rabbis, oh, she married, she married Noah. Oh, she's the mother of all of humanity today. Ah, okay, she's significant. What did we just do? We just took Cain's descendants and made Cain the mother of all humanity post-flood. post, post flood. So it's not just Seth's descendants, but also Cain's descendants. So I'm jumping ahead, but if you want to see the trick, if you want to see, it's verse, if you, it's, it's in, I'm jumping ahead. It's, it's chapter four, verse 22. 
Actually, I'm making a mistake. Some women are mentioned. The two wives of Lamech are mentioned, but they're mentioned for a reason. There's a reason why everyone is mentioned, why the women are mentioned. Also the men. Also the men are mentioned. There's a reason for it. We'll get to that. That's, that's, the, that's our next big story. But the bottom line is, um, uh, verse 22, Sila. where are we? And Sila too, she bore two Valkayin who sharpened all cutting implements of copper and iron. And the sister of two Valkayin was Nama. Okay, fine. Why do I need to know her name? Every name is significant. So the rabbis say Na Nama is the wife of Noach. What's really happening here is we really want to get to, we have to understand when we're going to read, out, and this is why I jumped ahead, even though I don't, you know, I'm not going to say I don't like to. I like to. The reason why I jumped ahead, even though it's a little confusing, is because we're really trying to figure out what's, who's Kayin, especially now when he finally does start negotiating with God and he finally starts talking and he finally starts doing things. In other words, we get more insight into his psyche post the sin. Now we say, what is going on with this person? And there's various ways of reading it. Some re, um, people read Kayin, some of the common, traditional commentaries read Kayin as all negative. And, but some of them find good in Cain. And the ones who find good in Cain, even after the sin, even though he's not perfect, but those who are trying to save Cain are really trying to save what Cain represents. In other words, to, say, to, to save Cain and say, he's not all that bad. And therefore he should survive the flood. And therefore his descendant was the wife of Noah. So it's, it's, it's not just a technicality. Do we come from Cain or not? It's, is Cain all bad or is Cain part of our story? That's really the question. And that's really the tension here. But I think uh, Vicky wants to ask a question and Mark wants to ask a question. So Vicky, go ahead. And then Mark, go ahead, Vicky. So my question is along the same lines. I'm trying to understand Cain and specifically his faith. He's uh, what God he believes in because his question that we discussed it last time when, when Hashem asked, asked him, uh, where, where is your brother? He says, I don't know. So my question is, is, is he like progressing is in terms of faith from Adam? Because if he, if he t tells to God, I don't know. So he doesn't believe in God that somebody who like, like the entity that's all powerful and knows everything. All knowing, the all powerful, not all knowing, right? Yeah, you have to understand the ancient, ancient uh, not only ancient, many philosophers believe that even if there is God, God is too great to be concerned with the actions of men. So in other words, um, they take for Aristotle, for example, they feel that saying that God has providence, that God cares about what you eat for breakfast and who you kill and who you don't, they say that's diminishing God. So there's two questions. There's a question of God's existence, and then there's the question of God's providence and God's knowledge, not because he's not capable of knowing, because he's not interested in knowing. Like if I tell you, um, it happens to be there's a colony of ants running around in your garden. Do you know which ant helped her, her friend this morning. You say, I don't, not, I don't know, not because I don't, I'm not capable of knowing, because it's simply not interesting to me. And then if I tell you no, you actually should know. If, if I say, well, you know uh, which aunt helped her friend this morning, mm -hmm. then, then, then you say, why are you diminishing me? Why are you telling me that I'm concerned with such matters that are insignificant to a human being, right? So it's a, it's a big debate of in other words, a it's a philosophical debate. We know where Judaism comes down un 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 unequivocally. We know Judaism believes the whole purpose, the whole premise of the Torah. In other words, the whole idea of commandment is predicated on the fact not only that there is a God, but that God um, knows and wants to know and is concerned for behavior, the actions of men. But Cain could believe in God, yet miss that very important link, which is a critical link to morality. If even, even if you believe in God, but you don't believe that God is concerned with what people do, then the, the morality is shaken. Is that the same as um, is his father's belief? Those to Adam also was similar response? It all depends what story you want to tell. I could tell you a story where a Cain advances over his father. His father, in other words, that he really does understand that God knows. And therefore, what he says last week, when he says, I don't know where my brother is. What he's really saying is, I don't know that I'm responsible for my brother. So it all depends which, which commentary you want to adapt. So you, there are many stories that can be told here. So if we're ever going to make a movie, there's not, it's not going to be, maybe we have a few versions. Um, there's different stories you want to tell. Now, why are the rabbis telling different stories? Can't they just decide which story to tell? Well, the real answer is because the lesson branches out and different people have to hear different messages. The person who does not 
you see, so, so there is no one simple message. It is written in a way that is intentionally vague because the, the, the message we need to take away from this story is multifaceted and different people have to hear different things and therefore it's written in a way that can tolerate multiple interpretations. And this is true for any, any, any story in the Torah. Thank you. So basically, our our face understanding of face is evolving as as is kinds. I think so. I think so. That's yeah. that's a kind. Or you could say that the negative view is he's trying to trick God. And Rashi does say that later. You'll see he does say that it seems like he is tricking God. So again, like I said, I can't. The the problem with with learning in the traditional way is that there's not one there's not one interpretation. That's a weak that's a weakness and a strength. Right. It's so, a, so okay. it's a it makes us think. Right. Indeed. How many years after? Thank you. Mark, do you want to share anything or was it so, such a long time ago? <laughs> no, I just, um, in verse 15, you yeah. translated to the seventh generation and Chabad translated sevenfold Shabbat time. Yes. And, I, I, and it's a totally different meaning. Yes. So, so um, yeah, it, it depends what God is saying here. Yeah. it's. It, I am saying, they're saying, um, Isn't vengeance will be seven times as bad on the person who kills him. Right. That is an, certainly an interpretation. It's not Rashi's. I'm just looking at what Rashi says. Rashi says the way our school translates Shiva time is seven generations. The, the Chabad is translating it probably more the simple, inter, the simple Hebrew, but without Rashi, Shiva time is seven, sevenfold. So we'll, we'll get to that. We'll get to that to figure out what God is saying. But yes, every, it's, it's, it's written a little, a little uh, cryptic which is why we have multiple interpretations. Okay. Rabbi, I'm question, I question what it meant when it said he built cities. This okay. would, under, I, I don't understand what the Bible means by cities, first of all, except maybe a, just a permanent habitation of a group of buildings, what it is, but it assumes um, a civilization already. Right. That's, that's one thing. And the other thing is, what does it say about cities in the Bible? Does the Bible like cities? That's a very good question. That's a very good question. We should, does the Bible like cities? Is it like suburbs? Is it like rural areas? Like, does the Bible like farmers? What does the Bible like? That's a, that is a very serious question. That is a very serious question. And like everything else in Kai, and I could tell you two stories. <laughs> make it either way. But it's a serious question because remember, we're going to get soon, sooner, soon enough, we're going to get to the story of the Tower of Babel. And Tower of Babel is terrible, terrible sin that God descends and scatters the, Jewish, the people all around because they're building this tower. The only problem with the story is that nobody can figure out what the, prob what the problem is. That's the only problem with the story. No one knows what the problem is. The Bible doesn't say the problem. So then people start thinking so is building towers, is it good? Is it bad? Does it depend? How you build, why you build? It's a very serious question that keeps coming up. What is the what is the Bible's view toward uh, civilization, toward 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 uh, man-made uh, living spaces? I guess cities, you know, cities and ta and towers. Now, now we're everybody is dealing with this every day. You turn on the radio, all people want to figure the, or the press. You want to figure. People want to know: Are we ever going to go back to work? Is Midtown Manhattan going to fill up? If you're a landlord, you don't know what to do. So, our, what do we want? We want people staying home. We want people getting together. Where do people want to live? This is a question that uh, that is very current. So, um, what does what, what does the Bible say? What is the Bible telling you about cities? If the founder of cities is Cain, oh, so what is it? So, so, so our city is good. Well, it depends. Is Cain good? Oh, did Cain repent? To what degree did he repent? So this this has ramifications depending on what degree Cain repented before he built his city. That will tell you. How is our city something good or something bad? And maybe they're a mixed bag because kind of repentance was not complete. Rabbi, you, and there's an earlier question that's also, what does it mean when God said you will be a wanderer? Yeah. If, he's, if he's building cities, I mean, the man has to eat. He's got to establish some kind of permanency. That's one aspect. But the other is it could be understood metaphorically. You're going to always wonder you're going to always second guess yourself your wandering is not of the physical kind it's of yeah. the spiritual emotional kind correct so you're not going to have peace of mind there'll be no serenity so we'll get to all of this but we have to first we have we have to at least make some semblance of going in order make believe we care about order so otherwise we're going to scare people away okay so let's go. sorry 
<laughs> let's go back. Let's go back a little and just try to just try to keep keep the order of the verses. But yes, excellent points. We're going to address the cities. We're going to address the wandering. And the wandering has a lot of questions because seemingly I'm not sure he wandered. He built a city, and it says cities. But the next verse says city. It says in the singular. It says that he built. He, he built. He built. He named the city like his son, like the name of his son Hanoch. So ultimately, he he builds one city. Let me ask you another question. What happens if you name your child, you name the city the same name as your child? What does that tell you about your child and your city? Who do you love more? Is it a compliment to your child? Is it a compliment to your city? If I'm the child and my father goes to work and he comes home and says, you know what? I named my office, I named him, I named it your name. So now I could spend time in my office. I don't have to actually have to see you because your, you, my office is just as important to me as you are. So this is this this is this a joke? Is this serious? Is this positive? I, should you name your child? Should you name your city the name of your child? Does that tell you that you have your values straight or confused? Again, everything here is up for interpretation. There's certainly a lot of ingredients here that we have to think about. How many people feel that you know their parents valued something more than they value themselves. And this can be very, very uh, tr uh, troubling to a child or to an adult. I think we have to, we have a doctor here to confirm what I'm saying, I hope. Um, so this is, this is the, the, again, every verse here is written in a way that has multiple interpretations because there's multiple stories taking place perhaps. And every, every, every sage in their time needed something to felt that, that uh, this theme has to be emphasized and that's why they explain it the way they do. Okay, so let's go. Let's start with. Let's start from the beginning. No, not the beginning. Let's start from 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 the from from the curse here. So the punishment. I'm going back to verse eleven, which is really what we were supposed to start with. Therefore, you are cursed more than the ground. Now it says more than the ground. That's what Rashi says. But arurata min hadama me. Jill, back me up here, please. Me is from. It could be read. You are cursed from the ground. So, in other words, your curse, your punishment comes from the ground. Um, that's one way. Another way is to say um, you're cursed more than the ground. In other words, the ground was cursed after the sin of Adam to give forth its to give forth the 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 the, the, the thorns and and weeds. But now it's going to it's going to increase its curse for you. Well, that's the two interpretations. Either you're cursed more from the ground, or you're going to be even cursed more than the ground, more than the curse that the ground had up until this point. And what are we going to say? We're going to say that the earth will no longer give its yield, yield its strength to you. What did the earth do wrong? Why are we mixing the earth in here? You want to punish the guy, punish the guy. What does the earth have to do? So that's why some of the commentaries are saying the earth is a critical part of the story. Why did Cain sin? You know what Cain sinned? Because he's a farmer. So the punishment has to be you have to disconnect him from the land because his connection to the land caused the sin. And therefore, if you want to, the, 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 the result if you want to lead him to teshuva, to repentance, if you want to avoid the mistake again, he must be disconnected from the land. What's the problem with someone who's connected to the land? What's the problem with land ownership? What's the problem with agriculture? The problem is we alluded to in the past, as a, when we tried to con con um, contrast the farmer to the to the shepherd. When you be, when you work the land, when you own the land, you think you become. You, there's a danger that a person becomes um, feels of himself as the owner of the land. The owner of the land means he is the creator. In other words, he's all powerful. He owns the earth. And that idea of I own the earth, everything here is a product of my own creation, that is spiritually dangerous. And if you track Cain, there's a big difference between Cain and Hevel. What's the difference between Cain and Hevel? Hevel, the verse says, gives God the first, the first sheep. Mi wrote the firstborn sheep. Cain, gives God some of the produce, specifically not the first one. What's the difference? If God is your partner, and maybe even a minor partner, you don't have to give him the fr fruit first. For Hevel, God is the creator. If God is the creator, we're dependent on God, God gets the first portion. He doesn't need a lot, but it needs to be first to acknowledge that everything comes from him. From Cain's perspective, he's a partner with God. So God doesn't have to get before him. 
In other words, the psychological effect of owning land is that you can become to the point where I am the master and I own the land and I'm all powerful. And we alluded to this in the, in the, in the past, the concepts of slavery begin when you have land ownership. That's Egypt, land on, not, not land ownership, sorry, agriculture. When you have agriculture, you realize I, I'm, I, my, my fate is in my hands and I need the power and I need help. So I subjugate other people. That's why slavery begins in ancient Egypt. So the, what the Torah is telling you here is not that land ownership is bad because the Torah is in fact in Israel, it's agriculture. So agriculture is not bad, but agriculture is dangerous. And therefore the Torah puts in many laws to protect us against the spiritual, the spiritual danger of agriculture. What are those? All the mitzvot of tithing, all the commandments of tithing, the commandment on the seventh year of the sabbatical to not work the land once in seven years, even though it's a great loss, financial loss for the owner. A seven, a seven, a, the land has to rest one, one, one year every seven years. But what's the point? The, the Torah says to remind us, Kili kal ha'aretz, the land belongs not to you, but to God. And Cain, because, why does, he come, why does he come to kill his brother? Because he thinks he's all powerful. Why does he think he's all powerful? Because he's, in, he's, he's involved in agriculture and he does not have the humility to realize that the blessing comes from God. And therefore, we have to disconnect him from the land. The land can't keep him, can't keep, keep yielding its produce to him because he used that in a negative way. And that's just gonna uh, intensify the possibility of another mistake. So that is why the land is critical. The fact that he is supposed to be moving is, is critical because he cannot have that ownership. When you live in one place, you, you, in your mind, you become that owner of that place. If I'm always on the move, I never, I never get to that level of arrogance because I'm always new, I'm always a stranger. I never take possession and control over the land. Rabbi, yes. uh, um, is, is that kind of a, from Hashem's point of view to repair theological problem that Cain has, like thinking that God doesn't know. So when he just, he's forced to disconnect from the land and maybe he's in a city, then um, his connection with God will strengthen. I think that, I, I, I think that, let's put the city aside for a second, but I think that when I feel I'm all powerful, uh, that that becomes a danger, a spiritual danger. When I feel that I have no permanence, I'm dependent on my environment, I'm more open to God. What do you see that later? You see that later with the contrast that Moshe makes between Israel and Egypt. In Egypt, I don't need God, I have the Nile. In Israel, I need rain. The problem is it doesn't rain. So I have to keep looking up. I mean, it rains, but not, as, not the way it, it rains in uh, New England. So the problem is you're always looking upward, dependent on God. And that's what Moshe says. There's a, there's a certain beauty that you have a relationship with God. You're dependent on God. But if I'm the master of the earth and I view myself as the master of the earth, if I'm not careful, I can get to the point where I'm the owner, I'm the creator, my, my, my destiny is in my hands. I don't need anybody. I make the rules on my little piece of ground. And if you come into my field, I could kill you. So that basically is is response to the kind's response because I don't know it means he has a problem with believing God and th that needs to be corrected. Taking it to a theological perspective because the, but, you, but I don't know that people have to be that philosophical. I think I think the practical economics affect how we think about ourselves and how we think about people. In other words, forget philosophy is a little bit too abstract. That's why. I'm a little hesitant to make this about a philosophical philosophy. I think there's a certain level of practicality and Moshe keeps reiterating this in the book of Deuteronomy. The more successful I become, the more danger I, I the, more, the, more, the more the danger is that I will forget about God. But here it's much more than that. It's not just success. I'm successful in, 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 in the city. I'm a successful in the stock market. I'm successful in some human, um, human, human environment, but I'm successful in agriculture that has land ownership and it has the creation, I see that what I put in comes out, that, 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 that the mind frame of the person invested in agriculture see, could, be, could be very dangerous. I'm the owner of the land. Okay, if I'm the owner of the land, what else do I own on this land? Well, I own everything on the land. I also own the morality. I also make the rules. So there's a spiritual danger. So what do we have to do? We have to change the environment, right? We'll talk about it uh, 
We, you know, so there's different ways of changing behavior. One, one way of changing behavior is changing the environment, changing what triggers you, right? So what triggers the negative behavior here is the agriculture. So God says, if you're ever going to repent, if you're ever to re realize, uh, correct the mistake, we have to remove you from the source of the mistake. What's the source of the mistake? La the Cain was over the Dama. Cain is, 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 works the land. He feels that he wants that ownership. And therefore, God says the result is it will no longer give, give yield its produce to you. You will never make that mistake again because you will realize that when you invest in the land and the land is not working, crops are failing. Why? It's not just the punishment we have to get him back. It's we cannot give him that which caused his spiritual downfall, that arrogance to say that I am God-like, that the Torah is very conscious of. So again, it's not a question of agriculture, good or bad. It's, it's clearly good that we go to Israel to, get, to, to invest in agriculture, to work the land. All the blessings to the tribes are really, many of the tribes are blessed with very poetic descriptions of successful agriculture. You know, you dip your, you dip your, your garment in wine, you dip your feet into oil, all descriptions of abundance in agriculture. So the clearly agriculture is not bad. But, I, but, but agriculture is dangerous, spiritually dangerous. I have a question. Isn't it seem that Cain brought it first? He was the one who came right. up with the idea of thanking God. Correct. He said, he, it hadn't, no one ever thought of that. And he said, oh, I have to thank God for what he gave me. Have all just copied him. Correct. Have a copied. And the problem with copying is that when you copy, you can improve. That's what happened when... But it was Cain uh, who first thought, I should thank God for the, for the produce here. Correct, but that's human innovation, right? What's the story with, uh, with um, I forget his name, oh my God. Oh my God, you should know this, you know, we live in the modern world. Apple, Apple the Apple CEO uh, who passed away. Jobs. Jobs, Steve Jobs, so what happened? You know, the story, he went and he saw that it, it, in, in the Bell Labs, I think he sees the mouse and then he improves upon it and he changes the world. So yes, innovation sees, I see somebody else doing something better and I improve on it. So Cain, we have to give him his credit. We have to give him his credit. He is, he's the one who realizes you have to give God, but the Torah goes out of its way to say he does not give first. He's not give first, God's a partner, but he's not first, I'm first. So in other words, that's telling, it's telling of how, who, who does he view as the, as, as the owner, as the boss, as the one who, who, who who's, who's makes, makes the rules here. So it seems, again, that's one interpretation, I'm not saying it's the only interpretation. Now. Let's continue a little bit. Let's talk about um, let's talk about the end of the verse. The end of the verse is Navanati Eva Aretz, you will be a wanderer in the land. So Jill alluded to this, and many people say this, there are Beno Bahaye. Um, so Kabbalistic commentaries and other people say that this is not a description of it's not a geographical description. It's not that you're going to be on the move. Yes, you're going to be on the move, but that's not what we're referring to. What we're referring to is if you are a Kayan. What is Kayin? We said Kayin comes from the word acquisition. If you're taken over by your desire to acquire, if you're taken over by the ambition, which is what Kayin had, you will always be a wanderer. You will never rest. He quotes the verse from King Solomon, the lover of money will never be satisfied um, with money because no matter how much you have, you will want more. So the Kayin mentality which leads to murder, which led to murder, will lead to other things as well. It's going to rob the 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 the, the Kayan of his own tranquility, and therefore he's always running around and never peaceful. And even when he gets home on the weekend, he's not peaceful because he always wants more. So Jill was right that some of the some of the commentaries explain that that is indeed a a a, a state of mind. And just to jump ahead, because it's related, the Kliyakar says this about Bahi Boneir. He became a builder of a city. Now, the problem here is with the gra grammar, a city is one city, you build a city. And then it says, he names the city for his son Hanoch, but bone means continuous. He's continuously building a city. What does that mean? That means he never finishes the project. In other words, his whole life, he's never satisfied with, with what he has. He keeps, he keeps, uh, he keep, he keeps building. He never finishes. And um, that's really the same idea that uh, Rabbeinu Bahaya says about Kayin. Oh, the, okay, Kliyakar connects the two, beautiful. So the point here is like this. When the Torah says, 
you will be a wanderer. You can read this as a punishment, or you can read this as a warning and a description. God is telling Cain, and God is telling us, listening into the conversation, that if we make the mistake of Cain, which is we understand we all we want that what we want and value most is acquisition. And again, that's the, and, and therefore we that that sense of acquisition gives us the power that we're not only with God, but like God, right? Going back to what we had said earlier, that with Eve, she says when she gives birth to Cain, she says, I created man with God. Okay. Um, Cain does sort of doesn't necessarily always feel that he's a partner with God. So he feels like I'm the creator, I have creative power. Now, if and, and, and he expresses that through his desire to, to acquire because that makes him feel the power of acquisition makes him feel uh, godlike, except that he feels that he is God, not that he's partner with God. So in that sense, what God is telling you, if you will be like I and what's going to happen, you're always going to wander, you're never going to be satisfied, you're going to keep moving. So that's that that is uh, what Jill alluded to, and that is correct according to the sages. Now, um, excuse me, Rabbi. Yes. But just looking at not to be the devil's advocate, but um, in, kind of advocate. Okay. Okay, but uh, in the modern American thinking, having a restless mind is a very positive thing. Having the restless mind is a very positive thing. Um, ambition is a very positive thing. However, ambition has a lot of tr problems. In other words, there's the idea of happiness. So you look at the happiness measure in America, we're terrible. People are not happy, people are not satisfied. So ambition is very good for society. It allows for innovation. It gets us out of the cave. It gets us driving fancy cars and um, it gets us on, on modern computers that can do Zoom. So ambition is cr certainly equals innovation. And, and advancement, there's no question about that. But does ambition bring happiness? Uh, probably no, I need some help here. I'm going into Dr. Beth's territory, but ambition, people are not happy. So the question is that you need to have a balance. You have to be able to be ambitious when you're at work, but then you, when you're on vacation, you have to be able to seize ambition. You have to be able to realize what the, what the ethics of the fathers say who is wealthy, that one who is happy with his lot. Because if you don't, if you're not, not able to cultivate a sense of gratitude for what I have, I will never be happy. And no matter what I have, it's going to be a tragedy because I'm always wandering. I always feel like I'm missing. So ambition is Cain. But Cain has to, the, again, the balance of Cain, the balance what I think Eve had. Kaniti Ishet Hashem, I acquired man with God. In other words, there's some balance between my desire to acquire, which is an expression of godliness, and realizing that there's more to my life. And therefore, acquisition is not everything, and therefore, I need to be satisfied with what I have. On the weekend, when I get home, tomorrow I go to work, I can also turn on my ambition. But the truly successful person is the person who is able to be ambitious when necessary and able to celebrate their achievements on Shabbat. What is Shabbat? The sages say that something very interesting, that it's not enough to rest on Shabbat, because that just means you're not doing any work. They say on Shabbat, you have to view as if all your projects, all your work is done. There's nothing left to be done. There's no more ambition. Can't be ambitious for the spiritual world on Shabbat. And the point is you have to be able to control it because otherwise you cannot separate yourself from that ambition. So I agree, Kayin, that the, the idea of Kayin is necessary, but you have also have to be able to stop building the city. You have to be able to build the city, but you also have to be able to be satisfied with the current achievement. And some people are very ambitious and they move the world forward, but are they happy and are they satisfied? And on their deathbed, do they say, oh, I wish I was in the office a few more hours in my life. That never happens because they have the Kayin, but they don't have the ability to realize that don't be a wanderer. Rabbi, what does Vidrash say about the end of um, Cain's life and what he any any comment about whether we'll he learned that. anything? That was, that was killed by his great grandchild. We'll get to that. We'll get to that. Okay. We'll get to that. So, Rabbi, the, in sentence thirteen, when it says uh, "Gadol on oni on so. so yeah, so let's let, 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 yeah go ahead. You asked the question. We'll jump to that right away. Go ahead. So, um, is that question answered by the Torah? It's a, it's a rhetorical question. 
it's a rhetorical question, but maybe it is answered. Depending how you read God's response, maybe God responds and takes Kain's new claim into consideration. So I think in some sense, in some sense, it may be a question that the Torah does respond to, because God somehow grant Kain says something, and God says, "Okay, you know what? Uh, whoever kills Kain will be." I don't know how to translate this. Uh, sevenfold or in seven generations, we'll read. We read this. So it seems like God does listen to Cain. But let's read. Let's read the verse. Let's just read. So we'll read thirteen in isolation, and we'll read thirteen connected to fourteen. So you read thirteen. It says, "Cain said to Hashem, is my iniquity too great to be borne?'" Now, I told you this can be read as a confession. God tells to Cain, "My God says to Cain, Cain says to God, my iniquity is too great to be borne." That would be a perfect confession. The problem why the rabbis don't say that, why Rashi says it's a, it's a question, it's a rhetorical question. God is telling, Kain is telling God, what? You can't handle my sin? Big deal, I killed my brother. That's why you're giving me such a terrible uh, punishment that I'm going to be wandering. In other words, what Rashi is doing is saying, this is not a confession. This is, make no mistake, this is not a confession. This is just a rhetorical question saying, God, why can't you carry my sin? Why are you punishing me so severely? Why do the rabbis say, what's so terrible to think that Kain confessed? So the reason is very beautiful. The reason is what happens when someone confesses. When they confess, you realize that I did, um, you talk something, talk about the victim. Talk about Hevel. What does Cain talk about? Himself. Verse 14, all he talks about is himself. My sin was so terrible. Now my punishment is gonna be so bad. The punishment, why are you focusing on the punishment? Why are you focusing on yourself? What about the victim? In other words, if you are really take confessing, if this is a sign of repentance, then why don't you feel and, and voice Hevel's pain? Instead, you're talking about yourself. In other words, you never left, Kai never leaves his own, um, his focus on his own self, on his own ego. So if God came to, Sham Shinafal here says this beautifully, if God comes to Cain right now, after that sentence of, is my sin too great to be born? If God would come to him and say, where is your brother? He still would say, me, my brother? I'm not responsible for my brother. In other words, nothing changed in his attitude. He doesn't become a person now more sensitive to other people, right? Let's read verse 14. What does he say? My sin is so good. My, is my, again, let's, if you want to read this, my iniquity is too great to bear. You can't, if you want to read it as a confession, then verse 14 doesn't work because 14 is all focused on self. Behold, you have banished me this day from the face of the earth. Can I be hidden from your presence? I must become a vagrant and a wanderer on earth. Whoever meets me will kill me. What do I hear? I, 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 me, me, me. That's all you hear about this verse. So the commentaries say, sorry, this is not a verse of confession. Yeah, and, and to prove that, I mean, he's if he didn't know what killing means and the finality of the... <laughs> Of the of human life, now he's concerned about his life being ended. So right, right. Kind so of he, proves it because he doesn't want to be killed at the same time. Just five minutes ago, he killed his brother. Right, right. So, so, so obviously he does realize what death is. So that's why the the, the commentaries are going to say that this is not. Don't be overly impressed by this by this by this confession. Now, we, what the, what the rabbis do. To us, we don't see it in English. We read it in the English that it's a, a rhetorical question to begin with. But in the Hebrew, there's no, there's no question mark in the Torah. It could be read either way. It could be read as a fine confession. But the rabbis don't want to read it as a confession because, like I said, all he's focused on is not on the sin or on the person he, he harmed. All he's focusing on is himself. What does that mean for me? Rabbi, just a rhetorical question on that. Why aren't there question marks in the Torah? Why aren't there question marks in the Torah? Um, the, the one answer is one answer. One answer is that that's a hard question to answer because I was about to answer because so so I was about to answer so that so the Torah could have multiple meanings. But then I realized that there are, there could be multiple answers to that question itself. So, so now I'm stuck. Um, you could do all kinds of answers. One answer is that by design, the Torah is designed to be. First of all, I'm not sure ancient texts did have. Again, I don't know. I'm not. I don't know enough. But but uh, three thousand years ago, I don't know how many how many people used uh, question marks. The, but in short, I would say that the way the Torah is written, the Torah wants to be dependent on an oral tradition, right? We we did we did, we did uh, the JLI on this six the six week course, so we really this will take six weeks. But in short, part of the part of the system of the Torah is we need a written text and an oral text, and one way to ensure that the written text does not take on its own meaning, but it's always connected to the oral tradition, is to build a text that cannot be read alone and necessitates an oral tradition. 
And the fact that it's so difficult to read because there are no, no punctuations is not, necess- is not a, a, a weakness, it's a strength depending on what the goal is. If the goal is to make this a self-standing work and this is a disaster. But if the goal is to um, ensure that there's always an oral tradition, this is passed on with the nuances, with the meaning, because you could, you, could, you could never write down every nuance. So by design, you write, you write a text that cannot be read and understood by itself. And that sort of forces the, the, the accompanying the text with the oral tradition. And oral tradition means as a student, as a teacher, ah, so the student, you can't just go to the library and pick up the book. You have to go to the teacher. Oh, you're going to the teacher. Now you have unbroken chain of tradition. Oh, now the teacher can convey nuance. You can't convey nuance. Look what happened to the United States Constitution a little more than 200 years later. Nobody knows what anything means over there. Right, a lot of people make a lot of money. A lot of people make a lot of money um, debating, debating what 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 the Constitution means. There's a lot of money at stake. The lawyers are happy, right? So the point is, you cannot put everything. You can't put nuance into a document. You need an oral tradition. Again, again, I'm not b- knocking the Constitution. It's possible that the Constitution also was written in a vague way to begin with. I don't want to get into this. The bottom line is, the goal of the Torah is, that's a possible answer. The goal of the Torah is to ensure that there's an oral tradition that accompanies it and therefore the document cannot be read on its own. Um, that's the short answer. I just want to conclude with some, I know I'm running uh, Rabbi, just one thought on that. Yes. So when we read the Torah on Saturday morning, when we read sentence 13, does it, when we read it with an inflection of a question? No, no, you, it's very, it's impossible to, to determine whether this is a, whether this is a question mark. The, in, in the Hebrew reading, Gadol you don't, there's no, in the in the trap, there's no there's no trap that 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 makes it sound like a question mark. This cannot be conveyed by the tone of voice. It has to be conveyed by looking into Rashi, and Rashi says, "Vitmiya, this is a question." But but the trap itself, going if I went to the synagogue and I didn't open the book, I, I'm saying listening to the way the, the 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 reader reads the Torah would again not give us this information. Because there is a there is a there is a tune, but there's no tune for a question. Okay, I want to conclude with one point because I feel like I feel like um, I feel like we're bashing kind too much, and we need a balance. One commentary that I saw this morning, miraculously, thank God. One commentary that I've said this morning says. You know what? Kind did did, 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 did did give a confession. Okay, he's a little too obsessed with himself, but you got to give him something. What is Kind's confession? Kind's confession is. Let's read. Let's read fourteen again. Beautiful. Fourteen. Behold, you have banished me this day from the face of the earth. Can I be hidden from your presence? Again, question. There's no question mark. I am hidden from your presence. I must become a vagrant and wanderer on earth. Whoever meets me will kill me. What is he saying? He's saying, I have no longer, I do no longer have divine protection. I am hidden from your presence. And because I have no divine protection, I'm going to be killed by anybody. The rabbis don't understand who's everybody. Is it his, his, his other people, other human beings? It's not likely that there's other human beings going to kill him. Who's it? His mother and father and sibling? Who's going to kill him? So some people say it's the animals, but we'll, we'll get to that later. The bottom line is he senses that if he does not have divine protection, he is vulnerable. Rabbi, um, just to push back on that one point, wouldn't the Torah maybe be thinking about Hevel's got sons who will come and kill Cain? Well, that's no sense. Hevel, there's no lineage from Hevel. Hevel was killed before he has children. But this would actually argue for Hevel having sons, wouldn't it? So, so that's why th- there's no lineage. We don't know. If Hevel had a child, we would, we would hear about it because we want to know the lineage. The Torah gives the lineage of Cain. The Torah gives lineage lineage of Sheit. The Torah gives no lineage of Hevel. The assumption is Hevel has no sons. But let me finish the point, then, we'll, then we could debate it. Let's finish the point here. So therefore, God says, so, so one way to read this is even though he's so selfish, and Vicky is right, he has not been cured about the focus on self. So even his confession is about me. You know, the people are such narcissists. You know, my famous joke. Okay, I don't have time for jokes now, but the fame, okay, I'll say the joke. The joke is the guy, even when they're thinking about you, they're thinking about themselves. So the guy takes the girl on a date and he's talking about himself for two hours. After two hours, he says, no, it's enough me talking about me. Now you tell me what you think about me, right? <laughs> the confession is really, how, how is that going to affect me? Oh, the sin was so bad. Look what's going to happen to me. You stop talking about yourself. 
So he's still obsessed with self, but yet he recognizes that if I'm concealed from God's presence, anyone who finds me will kill me. I have no more protection. So um, one commentary says that is a beautiful, that, that, is, that, is, a, that is a confession. That, that is a semi-confession. And therefore, this is the big idea. I have a problem. The problem is, it doesn't seem that Cain does God's commandment. He doesn't wander. He builds a city. And even before it's in the city, if you look at, even before he built the city, look at verse 16. Cain left the presence of Hashem and settled in the land of Node, east of Eden. He settled. He didn't wander. Now that's why some people say he left the presence, he, 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 uh, Cain left the presence of Hashem. What does that mean? Is it good? Is it bad? We'll get to that next week. But the bottom line is Cain settles. Cain does not wander. And then he builds a city. So what's happening? So one way to read it, Cain is not listening to God. He never repented. God gave him the punishment. He doesn't listen. Okay. Says this commentary. I think it's the Malbim, but I don't think I copied it. He says, one second. No, 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 no. You're missing the point here. He says, he says, God diminished the punishment because, because he confessed, because he recognized, again, the problem is his arrogance that he thinks he's God. When he realizes that because he sins, he doesn't have divine protection and he's vulnerable, that itself is a form of repentance. And therefore, God diminishes the punishment. But for this, you need to not look at the Hebrew. You can't look at the English. If you look at verse 12, they translate um, the punishment. It shall no longer yield its strength to you. You shall become a vagrant and a wanderer on earth. Na vanad. Na vanad. Two expressions of moving around. Now, what does Cain do? Cain, in, in verse 16, so put one finger on 12 and one finger on 15, especially in the Hebrew. So God says, Navanad, you can you'd base, Navanad, two expressions of wandering. Then it says, Cain emerges from before God. He, 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 uh, he left the presence of God. By say he goes out. Even left is, is the translation. It's trying to paint it that he's leaving God. But by say Cain emerges from the presence of God and settle in the land of Node. What's Node? What's the name of Node? If you look back at 12, the two words for wandering is Na-Vanad. Na-Vanad. The second one is Node. So Cain has the second, not the first. So the Malvin says something brilliant. He says, look, there's two concepts here. Na me means moving all around from city to city. Na, nad, means within one city to move around within one city. And he says, because God confesses, before, because Cain confesses, no longer does he have to do both. He doesn't have to move from city to city, from region to region, but he only has the second half. Within the region itself, he could move around. And that's why Cain is not defying God's words. Why is this so beautiful? Because if you look later in the Torah, what's the punishment for someone who kills someone by mistake? Again, assuming Cain kills someone by mistake. What do I mean by mistake? Even if he knew that it's a prohibition, he never, it was the first time it happened. So you have to give him a little leniency. Okay, if we have any defense, defense attorneys, you got to give him a little break. He's the first one. So what's the, so Cain in some sense was by mistake. Okay. Um, what's the punishment for someone who kills someone by mistake? He city runs, of refuge. City of refuge. What happens to the refuge? He has to go to a city. He has to leave his place, go to that city, but he doesn't have to move from city to city. So in that sense, what happens to Cain is exactly what's going to happen to the later generations. And according to this interpretation, it's his tune toned down. His punishment is toned down because he recognizes. What does he recognize? He recognizes that if I'm hidden from God, if I don't have the divine protection, now that my brother, pun now that now that God punishes me, I don't have divine protection. Anyone who will kill me, anyone who will find me, will kill me. So because of that, because of that, um, his punishment is actually. Um, uh, half of the punishment is 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 um, is, is diminished. So I think that's nice if you want to defend Cain because again it shows how when Cain chooses to live in one region, he's not really violating God's commandment because God he, he he's he's keeping half of the punishment and also it also uh, aligns with the punishment that's going to be later in the Torah for the person who kill who accidental killer. Um, where he would have to leave his place, so he has to wander, but he can wander with one in within one region. He doesn't have to go from region to region. Yeah, that also may, may explain the putting a mark, because God senses that Cain is on the way to 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 repentance and gives him more time. Right. So I so we'll get to the mark next week. But a degree of repentance. I'm not saying this is full repentance. 
because because but uh, the right track kind of so give him more time in a sense i think kyan is a complex figure and we're all a little bit of kyan we're not black or white we're not good or bad we're a mixed bag and therefore even when they confess they're focused on self kyan is the guy we like you know not because because kyan is the human human experience kyan is the human struggle and and even when he confesses the confession is not full so the, so one way to read it is he violates God's commandment. He goes to one place, he settles. He's actually leaving the presence of God. That's how the article translates it. And the, the, and the, Red, and the Medrash says the same thing. The Medrash says when he walks out from before God, he's tricking God. He's telling God, yeah, I'm going to wander. What does he do? He goes and he settles. So that's one way to read it, that he's in defiance. He's defying God. But, the, but another way to read it, and also rabbinic interpretation, is that they're saying it's not so simple. Cain does have a degree of repentance, not full, but a degree. And God recognizes that. And God allows for that and therefore accommodates and, and diminishes part of the punishment because of the confession. So even though it was late and even though it was not complete, but it still counts for something. Thank you. I have a question. I have a comment. That it says here, Komotai Yahargani, right? That seems to think that I agree with what you said, that Kain didn't really... Um, uh, admit that he, what he did was wrong because other people are going to kill him just like he killed someone else. Okay, so 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 he so, he is still of the opinion that killing someone is acceptable if you're angry. So I agree with you that this that this is a even if that this is a this That's is. What a, I'm saying it's, a, it's not it's a it's a not really a confession. I, yes, I agree with you. People, I agree. killing is an okay thing to do. I I don't know if he's saying it's okay. He's afraid that it's going to happen to him. But I agree. Someone else will do. If I could do it. You know, I wasn't wrong. Other people, you know, this is what people, it was an acceptable thing to do. And, 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 that, and you'll see Cain's descendants become killers, become serial killers. So you're right. Cain, Cain knows. Cain says, look, Cain says, I did it. Maybe other people will do it. So I agree that this is not what I would call a perfect confession. And again, if you want to read it that Cain did not confess at all, many people say that. Shamshan of here says that. This is no confession at all. But if you want to look at and say Cain is a... Um, not a, even though confession is not perfect, but there's some, you want to give him some um, a degree of, 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 of salvation. You want to say something has changed. There's some, we're making slow progress. Um, Bob always wants to show how we are moving. We're moving slowly, but we're moving some progress. So did Cain, if I have to, if you're the defense attorney, if you have to find some way to defend Cain, what would you grab onto? Seemingly nothing. It's very hard. But the rabbis are good defense attorneys. So what do they say? They say, oh, something good. What? He realizes that without God's protection, he's vulnerable. Okay, that counts for something. Okay, so, so, so that's a defense attorney. If you ever need a defense attorney, the rabbis are very good at it. So I agree that it's very hard. It, like, like this is not the symbol of someone who's confessing. This is not the symbol of someone who's taking responsibility for the crime. To the contrary, this guy's only focused on him, how it's going to affect me. So this is not the symbol of what we would, uh, we would, we would put forth as someone for repentance. And that's why when the sages say, who was the first person who repented? We never say Cain. We say it was Judah. It was never Cain. Cain is not, this is, this is a very weak defense. This is a very weak um, um, repentance. However, on the other side, if you, if you want to look subtle and you want to say, is there anything, is there anything that we can grab onto and say, the person, something, something positive within Cain's response. And then the rabbis say, oh, we found it. Look, he's self-centered, he's narcissistic, but he knows that without divine protection, he's vulnerable. Okay, that's enough to celebrate. <laughs> that's enough to, to find, to grab on and say, okay, something, that's, that's already something. Thank you. Okay, wonderful day, everybody. Sorry for going over time. It's against the rules, but... Um, Everybody, always welcome. Yeah. Always welcome. Bye. 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 Some amusing thoughts. Uh, as we say about Song of Songs, it's not just a love story. It's more about the relationship between God and um, people and the Jew. Um, I've got some amusing comments. Uh, you know, but uh, everybody knows about Neanderthals and Homo sapiens. Yes. And what happened. And as we look at it in this angle, Neanderthals were uh, hunter-gatherers uh, and some kind, uh, <laughs> I would say, of Havel, as opposed to human uh, homo sapiens were.
You're breaking up, Zina. We're losing you. Zina, the connection is weak, not because we don't want to hear what you're saying. Ah, uh, oh, I'm sorry. Oh, now go ahead. Here we go. Now we hear you. So he didn't hear anything. Start again. Start again. You're saying you're saying that that Neanderthals are more like Hevel. Uh huh. Uh, as opposed to Homo sapiens, uh, as a kind of kind. So maybe uh, Torah actually uh, have another interpretation. As a song of songs, it's not just right. Uh, yes. So, so you're making a point that, and I think that, uh, I think Neil also alluded to this, that the idea of kind, the idea of ambition, the idea of acquisition is necessary for human progress. And, and, that's, how I, kill, and the, that's how they kill Neanderthals. Right. right. Oh, that's how they got away with it. Okay. So I don't want to take it to that extreme, but I want to say that, what I do want to say is that's why the rabbis work hard to put Kayin on the ark. To say that Cain's descendants are saved, that Naama, we'll read about her in a few weeks, that there is the woman mentioned here, she becomes the wife of Cain. The scripture doesn't support it, but the rabbis push her, so to speak. We're literally almost forcing a descendant of Cain onto the ark. The ark means to save her, save humanity. If you read the story, the ark is where um, the flood destroys all of humanity except for the people on the flood. In other words, the world has to be rebuilt from the ingredients from the people who are on the ark. So there's a big difference whether you say that only Seth is on the ark, Chase is on the ark, and Chase is a good balance between Cain and Hevel. We'll get to him later. But even more than that, the rabbis are actually trying to put Cain on the ark as well. We have to push his descendants onto the ark. In other words, something about his desire for acquisition, just because in his life, it led him to murder. That is not enough of a reason to say that that entire attitude is negative. In fact, we need it to rebuild the world. So I think I think I think that's I think that it's not. I think that the, the Torah tells you the story. The Torah does not come and give out a marks of morality. This guy is ninety eight percent moral. This guy is fifty percent moral. The Torah is vague. The Torah is just telling you the story. What you make of the story, that's up to the that's up to the the interpretation. So we know the facts or some facts, but how, how what's the what's the message? Like I said, with the city, a city is good or bad. It doesn't say it directly. We have to figure it out, and therefore there's multiple interpretations. Maybe because there's multiple cities, not all cities are created equal. Not every city, not every culture, man-made culture has the same problems or, or is motivated by the by the same ideals. Okay.